Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophets. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph <coughs> awoke from sleep, he did as the angel commanded him. He took Mary as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had borne a son. And he named him Jesus. May God bless this reading to our understanding and our living. Amen. I don't know if any of you saw a little promotional video. I know some of you did because I got many um, suggestions <laughs> about how they feel Christmas. I think I can almost guarantee that most of us, to feel, feel Christmas, we do not turn to the Joseph story. <laughs> His decision to not expose Mary publicly to disgrace, but divorce, divorcing her quietly. A friend of mine from Tantour, a priest named John McKenna, when he was a little altar boy serving, heard this story, and the first time it, it kind of reached him, and he ran home crying to his mother, <laughs> saying, Mommy, was Joseph going to divorce Mary? <laughs> now this isn't the story we turn to when we want to feel Christmas. How do you feel Christmas? Is it the uh, decorations? Putting up the tree? You know, in my house, we have a little tradition. We, when each of our children was born, I went out and got one of those little, actually, I guess the first one was given to us, one of those little balls that says, Baby's First Christmas. And once the children became old enough to start decorating the tree, we would have them put their own Baby's First Christmas ball on the branches, and over the years, the ball would climb <laughs> the branches. And this is the first year that Heather won't be home to put her ball on the tree. Those decorations can make you feel like Christmas, and they can make you feel sad. I don't know if uh, you ever went to Grandma's house. This is Norman Rockwell, and Norman does a pretty good job of evoking the feeling of Christmas, but for many people, we look at Norman Rockwell's prints, and what they, we feel is nostalgia. The sadness for Christmas has passed, and for many people, these are Christmases that have never been. They are always on the lo outside looking in. And then there is uh, the Christmas movie. I, some people don't feel like Christmas until they've seen Alistair Sim transformed in A Christmas Carol every year. Or or maybe your Christmas movie is It's a Wonderful Life, or maybe White Christmas, Esther hates me watching all these things. <laughs> you have a movie that you need to see every year. They're getting kind of harder to find. I find they're replaced by these Hallmark card things, <laughs> which are sweeter than maple syrup. <laughs> Sometimes, it's hard to feel like Christmas. 
Even the Christmas movies do not reach you anymore when you have a loved one who is being overcome with Alzheimer's or some form of dementia. Or when it's your first Christmas after the death of someone with whom you spent all the Christmases of your childhood. Or maybe it's a divorce. Or maybe it's some other struggle in your family. Sometimes you just cannot find those decorations or those scenes or those events or those movies that make you feel like Christmas anymore. There's a famous uh, quotation from, sorry, from Peter Marshall. I'm going to turn this a little bit so that I can, well, I guess it is a direct line here. Um, Peter Marshall wrote in 1952 a sermon, and it was published in Look Magazine. Do you remember Look Magazine? Mm. It's one of those nostalgic things. And, uh, but it became famous, and like the letter written by Virginia, it's usually heard every year, and I love the ending. So we will not spend Christmas and observe Christmas. We will keep Christmas, keep that as it is, and all the loveliness of its ancient tradition. May we keep it in our hearts so that we may be kept in its hope. The only thing is, I don't really think it is our job to keep Christmas. Christmas isn't something we manufacture. It really is a gift. Some people can't get the gift. I'm going to save George Bernard Shaw for 10 o'clock. You can look up his quotation. <laughs> He uh, developed a society to abolish Christmas, and he was its only member. <laughs> Fortunately, I'm not sure if that's still true. But you know, I love <clears throat> one of the responses that came to my little video. Was someone who said, this is what makes me feel like Christmas, was Barbara Manners. And she sent me this video of Christmas taking place. Keep an eye on that little girl. Joseph, it's 
offended honor and superiority, and then discomfort and uncertainty again. You can see him wringing his hands, what am I to do? And gradually, as they surrender all their expectations and all their commitments to receive this commitment of God, it slowly returns to, it slowly turns to rejoicing and a sense of being part of something greater than them unfolding in the world. Joseph is told, you shall name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. It doesn't say he will save them from suffering, or from heartbreak, or from the challenges of life. But it does say that this Jesus is synonymous with God is with us. That somehow this flagrantly improper event is the very solidarity of God with you in whatever situation you find yourself to tell you you are not alone and you are loved. When your loved one has Alzheimer's, when your beloved daughter is at home for Christmas, when your world is being torn asunder, whether politically or economically, God is with you. There's some kind of difference from anything that could have ever been. And you are not alone. It's a beautiful thing when this happens. I don't know how many were at the live nativity last Sunday afternoon, but uh, I was kind of amused by the fact that one of the animals in attendance was a kune kune pig from New Zealand. And I don't think there would have been a lot of pigs at the manger in Bethlehem. <laughs> Something about Judaism and pork. <laughs> But it was nice to be inclusive last Sunday. <laughs> and then I read this story this past week of a woman, her name is Jean Ballard, and Jean wrote of a time, and I don't know what had happened in her family, she doesn't go into these details, but she was in the mountains looking upon the Fraser Valley in a little farmstead all on her own looking after some rescue animals. It was the first Christmas in her life that she wasn't surrounded by family and there weren't stockings full of misshapen things hanging on the mantle. She was by herself and she was feeling sorry for herself. But she had these rescue animals to take care of and there was a pair of pot-bellied pigs who had been taken out of uh, horrible conditions and given to her to be cared for and brought back into some kind of serenity. Their names were Scotch and Soda. <laughs> and uh, Soda was actually pregnant and had a litter of ten little pot belly pigs. So Jean went out to the barn to check on them that Christmas Eve, full of a lack of feeling of Christmas. She went in and she saw them there and they were kind of huddled under the straw, so she went into the pen with them and had a blanket, she covered them up and actually she had discovered that Scotch liked to be sung to. Especially liked You Are My Sunshine. <laughs> so she sat down in the pen and sang to Scotch, and he kind of got up and put his head in her lap and cuddled up with her. And she felt Soda come over, and all ten little piglets <laughs> gathered around her. 
And, you know, she suddenly realized there was something significant about the number 12. <laughs> and there was something significant about being in a stable that Christmas Eve. And Christmas came to her. The presence of God in Jesus came to her. And there, all by herself, not having the Christmases that she knew, she felt Christmas so deeply. All over again, the first time. I hope that you will feel Christmas this year. So how do you feel Christmas? What does Christmas feel like to you? Are you feeling Christmas? Is there something in your life this year that you wouldn't mind sharing that we as your Christmas community can share with you. <clears throat> um, I, I, would, I would say that I feel Christmas and have been feeling Christmas for the last little bit um, because of our community and our church. We had a call in here a few weeks ago, a week and a half ago, saying that they were doing this, these Christmas parties for the 800 refugee children and they were shy of 200 gifts on, I think it was the Monday. At any rate, this community rallied and they brought forth more than what they needed and um, we were fortunate to be able to deliver a truckload of gifts. But beyond that, when I got there, I looked around and there were masses of bags. It was like the flea market all over again. And one woman, one woman on her own who works full time who's going to pop in that night and try and sort these, I guess there were probably about 400 there or 400 at another site. And I, I was feeling terrible because I couldn't be there to help her. I don't even know her, but it was that sense of, wow, somebody's facing Christmas with these little refugee children on her own, kind of climbing this mountain, mountain of toys. And um, that I, I left feeling, oh gosh, it's wonderful bringing the toys, but there's so much to be done now. They have to be sorted and put into age groups and genders and, you know, stuffies over here and, and wrapped. And there was so much to be done. And I left there feeling, this was great. We kind of came this far. But what happens now? This becomes such a massive job. And um, the, I don't know the Mantis family here. No, they're not. The Mantis family were going to go and help wrap on Friday night. So they were wrapping on Thursday and Friday night. And um, I ran into Erin, and she, I said, so you're going tonight? And she said, no. She said, they don't need us. All the toys are wrapped. Volunteers came that they didn't expect. Gifts came that they didn't expect. And it was just, that was for me, that was a huge feeling of Christmas to hear that, yes, this community rallied, but lots of communities were rallying for these little kids that are living in apartments, you know, or a hotel, you know, which ones are all the little kids. We saw them toddling through the lobbies and the grandmothers kind of sitting off to the side in, a, in an old hotel lobby that is now the home for these people, and the lobby becomes their street. And um, it, it, was, it was really a very joyful feeling. Thank you, all of you. And thank you, Donnelly. I mean, you rallied this community to, to respond in that way. So, the loaves and fishes, you did. <laughs> I think two of your dad, he was a New Year's Eve baby, Ross Lennox. Christmas Eve. Christmas Eve. Christmas Eve. Sorry. Thank you. because it really resonated with me um, this Christmas season. I uh, started a renovation in my home last January that was supposed to take four months, and we're still in the renovation process. 
and all of my Christmas decorations are in um, storage. So I don't have any Christmas decorations. I'm not even living in my home. And I have these beautiful nativity scenes, and one my um, mother had knitted by hand. It's beautiful. And I, I always took great pride setting it up. It was my thing. And um, it was, I was reading an Advent um, message last week, and it talked about the messy nativity. And it really got me thinking that I always thought these nativity scenes were really beautiful, having the cows looking over Jesus and you know, in the barn setting, and I just thought it was really adorable. But after reading this Advent, it really wasn't adorable. Um, even the travel um, with Mary on the donkey being nine months pregnant, I started thinking of myself thinking, um, I wouldn't even, I, I didn't even like riding the subway when I was pregnant. So, um, I started to reflect on some of the Christmases, and most of the Christmases I had with my with my children, and they really were messy. They were um, uh, fearful, and um, uh, getting together with, with some family was really, really difficult. And I think I got through that by putting up my lovely nativity set, making my house all decorated so that I wouldn't really have to deal with the messiness. So now that I don't have those things to keep me busy, I've really been reflecting and just trying to um, um, make an effort, I think, talking with people that I don't know or that people are going through possibly the messy season or just getting to know them better so that um, I can maybe share this message because I think a lot of us um, have anxieties around this time where family get-togethers aren't as um, joyful as what they would want to be and maybe have a sense of guilt that there's something wrong with what they're doing in life um, that's maybe creating this mess. Um, but God meets us wherever we are and if it's messy, um, certainly the Lord has been through that because there is nothing really great who's messy through this birth and also, also through this death. So, um, just thank you for kind of reinforcing that today because it, uh, it's been a real lesson for me. Thank you, Judy. That's a messy manger. I like that. You, did, you left out the pigs that were there. <laughs> yes? Sorry, I slept in the weeds. Um, my one big sister's here, she just rolled in, and that's a very special time um, to have her and her family here with us for Christmas. But um, it's a, a time where people uh, miss loved ones, and uh, I miss my dad a ton. But what was so beautiful was we were sitting last night um, just around the Christmas tree talking about all the wonderful memories of my dad at Christmas. And I, I wanted the sense of being with him so badly. And last night I had this dream, and he was there. And he was, you know, somewhere outside in the distance, and I was, you know, running up to this man thinking, is it my dad, is it my dad? And he, I don't know if you've had these dreams where you tap the person on their back, and they turn around, and you're so hopeful it's the person you think it is. And it turned, he turned around, it was him. Big smile on his face, big hugs, because we had talked about his hugs. And so what's beautiful, about what you're talking about, this feeling of Christmas, is we can think so much about the loss. And then what you said about God being with you is that God shows up. And he doesn't have to show up right there in front of you. He can show up in a dream, he can show up in what Don Lee saw at that uh, scene of two places. And I just think that's what's so And what brings me Christmas is just that thing of God in my Thank you, Karen. And it is being open to the way God comes to us, isn't it? That's so not manufacturing it, but being open. And I love the fact it came to you in a dream. And it's kind of a theme for the day. Well, I've been reflecting on the idea of light coming into the darkness, and the darkness not overcoming it. And for 
for me um, setting up lights in my dining room at the beginning of Advent has been very meaningful to me. We can get a real treat because I have um, teenagers and 20 year olds and, and they're just not into it at all. And I just thought, oh, they're not into it. I'm just going to put up my little tree with lights on it. Um, but around that tree, I put a star in the window and lights on. And I felt like I'm the only one in this family always plugging in and unplugging. But it was meaningful to me in these darkening days of December. And it was that kind of theological reminder of light. And then um, there was a night when I was out and I had to put on, to put on the lights. Um, but yet when I came home, the lights were on and my son was sitting on the couch and I thought, oh, that touched me that he would take the initiative to think to put on the lights. And by the way, the days are getting longer now. <laughs> I've noticed. <laughs>